Hi everyone at United Church of Chapel Hill. Welcome to worship today, the first Sunday of the new program year. And of course, we are commencing a full digital season of ministry for this fall. It's so different from what we have done in the past. Um, and yet, so much of what we have planned in the past has been reframed and rethought and redesigned for a digital format. I want to talk to you about that a little bit today. But first, I want to show you this amazing new mural that Christy Curran has, has painted in the youth room. Uh, just take a look at this. Okay. I feel like Vanna White here uh, showing these images to you this morning. Uh, but I just want you to take a good look at this because to me, this mural is an important symbol of our ministry, really in two ways. The first, of course, is that Christy has really captured the spirit of United Church of Chapel Hill and represented us visually in terms of the, the kind of church that we want to be, the kind of community that we want to welcome all people into. Uh, so it's interesting to think about this mural with reference to our identity as a church, our commitments, uh, and certainly the, the purpose of our youth ministry and and the, the, the wonderful community that is created in youth ministry at United Church of Chapel Hill. But a second thing really comes to mind for me in this mural, and that is uh, just, how, just how God has continued to bless us as we have been in this dispersion in recent months. Uh, Christy, by painting this mural, has shown us that the church is still alive, that the that the church is, is still active, that God continues to breathe life into us as a church. Just think about everything that we have done since the, the pandemic began. Uh, think about how initially we organized ourselves to, to, to deliver food to, to children who were locked out of school for the first three and then six and then nine weeks till May. Think about what we did over the summer uh, in creating the Spreading Justice Initiative to reach out to folks who have been uh, uh, affected economically uh, and financially and medically by the COVID-19 pandemic. And now think about how we are preparing for a fall season of digital ministry. Uh, we have proven that even in this pandemic when we can't come together as a church, we're still in ministry together. And that's how I hope that you will think about the fall. Uh, there are so many opportunities for us to get together. Every program area has a plan for digital ministry. Our choirs are meeting and leading us in worship. Youth ministry has a regular plan on Sunday evenings. Uh, children's ministry is uh, passing out worship bags on Friday afternoons and connecting with our families throughout the church. La Mesa is engaged in worship and ministry every single week. We have all sorts of small groups, uh, book groups, boards, committees that, that have not slowed down their work in recent months. So thank you, Christy Curran, for giving us this beautiful image of the kind of church that we want to be. And thank you for reminding us by putting this here this year in the midst of the pandemic that we are still called in this time to be a church together and that God is equipping us and resourcing us in new ways for ministry in the coming months. Of course, this Sunday, marking the first Sunday of the program year, means that Wednesdays Together begins this coming Wednesday where we're going to take up the conversation about Stamped, the young adult version of Ibram Kendi's book, Stamp from the Beginning, because we want this to be an intergenerational conversation accessible to everyone in the whole church. So we're going to be talking about this book specifically through this lens. How is anti-racism a practice of Christian formation? What does it mean for us as people of faith to work to eliminate racism in our lives, in our hearts, in our institutions, and our world. That's our theme for the first three weeks of Wednesdays together. So this Wednesday, 
Uh, 7 o'clock, I hope to see you on Zoom. Uh, I and the pastors are going to bring some reflections on this and lead some conversation about it. Next week, the youth of the church are leading our conversation about anti-racism as a Christian practice. And then on September 30th, the Reverend Tracy Blackman, uh, Associate General Minister of the United Church of Christ, a leading African-American woman in ministry, will be joining us uh, to lead us in uh, a similar conversation and to bring her thoughts and her inspiration. So, it is a full season of digital ministry. God is alive in this place, helping us to, to, to make a place of belonging for all God's children. I hope that you won't miss a single moment of it, and I plan to be there with you. I'm looking forward to it. The Old Testament reading from today is from the book of Exodus, chapter 14, verses 19 through 31. The angel of God who was going before the Israelite army moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord and the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Today's Gospel reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay... His Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their lord all that had taken place. Then his lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger his lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. 
so my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join with me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, throughout the narrative of the Exodus, God becomes, if anything, more determined to liberate the Israelites and more dreadful in doing so. You can imagine God's great clenched fists as escalating signs and portents go unheeded by Egypt's king. With Moses as the divine herald, God hurls frogs, gnats, flies, locusts at the oppressive tyrant, a pestilence of boils, a 5,000-year hailstorm, and none of these cosmic interventions increasing Pharaoh's motivation to release the Hebrews, God's frustration only grows. A river of undrinkable water a protracted eclipse of the sun that plunges the entire earth into darkness. Ten plagues now God has heaved against Pharaoh and the Egyptians and finally breaking the despotic king's hardened heart with the terrible sacrifice now remembered as the Passover. Granted a brief respite from their enslavement, the Hebrews stream out of Egypt as fast as they can flee. And Pharaoh's grief over his lost son, of course, soon turns to rage, and he sends the Egyptian army again in pursuit of them. And our white-knuckled God is still there, defending the Israelites in flight. And there's a a pillar of fire. Who knows exactly what it actually was, but that's what the text says. A, A pillar of fire from the earth to the sky that God places between the approaching Egyptian army and the Hebrews who were now fleeing across the Red Sea. And the waters have parted and the Hebrews are walking on dry land. And the Egyptian cavalry is getting stuck in the mud. Stuck in the muck. God clogs up their chariot wheels so that they cannot be turned. And and here is a break in the drama that I find a little bit humorous. An Egyptian officer has this sort of eureka moment. Uh, A light goes off in his head. He finally gets what's happening. Uh, And as he's down on his knees, stuck in the mud, struggling and straining to get his chariot moving again, he orders his soldiers to retreat. Let us turn back, he exclaims. God is fighting against us. Ha! You think? (laughs) What was your first clue? God was fighting against you. That's what every reader of this story is thinking. God has been fighting against the Egyptians since the moment they enslaved the Hebrews. It's not that God hates the Egyptians. It's that God cannot tolerate the enslavement of God's people. So from the very moment that that Joseph was displaced as chief of staff to Pharaoh and a new king arose who did not know Joseph, ever since that very moment, God has been fighting with the Egyptians. If you read the book of Exodus, the Hebrews are enslaved in chapter 1. And in chapter 2, Moses is born. Moses is born, and the liberator that God has anointed slips into the palace. At no point in this story since chapter 1 has God not been fighting the Egyptians. But Pharaoh's army continuously rebels against the purposes of God, first through the polite request for abolition, then through ten escalating plagues, and finally in this 
climactic battle by the Red Sea when this nameless officer comes to his senses? How did they not recognize that it is hopeless to continue when God is fighting against you? Just imagine the awakening. This soldier has by now seen it all. If he's stuck in the mud at the Red Sea, then you can bet that this is an experienced soldier who has lived through all the plagues and truly many tight spots. Maybe he has questioned in the past the purpose of this army and his place in it. Maybe he has wondered if it's right to follow these orders. Maybe he has inwardly questioned whether it's worth the moral cost to to keep these slaves or to pursue them once they have been set free. But this moment is different. This is the moment when this officer has lost all hope because he realizes that the cause he's fighting for has no future in the promises of God. What absolute despair. This reckoning with the intentions of God may explain so much about Pharaoh's determination to defy the liberating impulse of Moses. What a terrible fate, don't you think? To reach the conclusion that God is not on your side? Well, I I wouldn't want to face up to that either. But what a a sad and bitter place to dwell. Living in the knowledge that you are not right with God. And maybe that helps to explain one of the key mysteries of this story. Pharaoh doesn't let the Hebrews go because his heart is hardened. And specifically, the text says that God is the agent of this hardening. Every time Pharaoh reaches a point at the end of a plague when when maybe he might make a new decision to let the Hebrews go, we are told that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not listen. Why is God the agent of that hardening? And nobody seems to have a good answer to this. The Hebrew word used over and again for the hardening of Pharaoh's heart has several possible meanings. It could also mean, aside from harden, it could mean to stiffen, like, a, like an upper lip straining not to quiver, or to stiffen, like a back straightened in a defensive posture. But the word could also mean to grow heavy. And that I can imagine, Pharaoh's heart growing heavier and heavier with each passing plague. Pharaoh's heart weighed down by hopelessness and despair as Pharaoh copes with the knowledge that he is not right with God. Pharaoh's heart growing heavier as God adds to the burden each time Pharaoh chooses not to liberate the Hebrews. With each choice, Pharaoh finds himself further and further from the purposes of God. Pharaoh finds himself straining harder and harder against God's will. Pharaoh finds himself carrying a heavier and heavier load as he resists God's desire. Heavy the heart that cannot see itself in the promises of God. How heavy to feel oneself outside of God's care. How heavy to conclude, God does not love me. God has forsaken me. I have someday lived in that dark and bitter place. When all I could think was that spiteful God is working against me every step of the way. What a hard and heavy load sitting on your chest. And of course, all we want as readers is for Pharaoh just to reframe this, his thinking here. Look at it a different way, Pharaoh, we want to say. Uh, uh, what if you just thought about this in a different way? What, what, what if you believe not God is working against us, but we are working against God? What if the agent here wasn't wasn't God making your life difficult? What if it was you 
And what if we focused on, on your ability to change this situation, Pharaoh? And seen in this light, I think Pharaoh becomes a much more relatable and sympathetic character. You don't have to be a tyrant, although many tyrants are like this. You don't have to be a tyrant to blame God for your predicament. We can all relate to that sort of anger that says, God is working against me. And maybe we have also found ourselves like Pharaoh latched senselessly to plans or purposes that we know are not in accordance with God's will. And maybe we don't even believe ourselves in those plans and purposes anymore, but, but we don't know how to stop pursuing them. Well, in these instances, it's the Spirit that might somehow move in us. The Spirit that could somehow, sometimes, soften our hearts. Uh, maybe not until we are stuck in the mud so deep that we can't dislodge ourselves. But sometimes the Spirit speaks to us sooner than that. And sometimes the Spirit softens our heart more rapidly and readily than that. And that's when our hearts can shift from the angry cry, God is working against me. And in that moment, we recognize that the resistance is not in God, it's in us. That's when we might grant to God our consent. Okay, God, not my way, but yours. Summer will soon turn to fall, and around this time of year, I always think about the legend of the ginkgo tree. Most trees, as you know, turn their autumnal colors uh, slowly and, and uh, sporadically, and they begin to lose their leaves one by one. But in his poem about the ginkgo tree, Howard Nimerov writes about how the tree is is kind of stubborn in holding on to its branches. Well, about how most trees are sort of uh, stubborn by holding on to their leaves until the last possible moment. But Nimerov writes about how the ginkgo actually listens to the season. And, and he says, the ginkgo's leaves will change from green to yellow more or less all at one time. And then rather than resist the coming winter, and hang on to all of its leaves until it can't keep them anymore, until they're taken away from the tree, the ginkgo will actually shed its leaves in one gracious release. Now, you can walk past a, a ginkgo tree one evening and marvel at its full bright leaves and, and come back the next morning to find all the leaves rustling around on the ground. Well, we can sense no less the will of God if we listen to what the Spirit is saying to us in the way that the ginkgo tree listens to the changing of the season. We can sense the Spirit stirring in us, or we can sense the Spirit speaking in the silence of our thoughts, or we can feel the growing heaviness that tells us something is not right. Well, let me try to say this one final way before concluding, with just a little reflection that applies so many places in the church. I'm the national vice chair of the board of directors of the United Church of Christ. and This is a board that oversees the, the resources and the work of our denomination. And like so many institutions today, especially in the church, this is a board that has struggled with change. It struggled to adapt to some new paradigms. And there are a lot of strongly held opinions and differences of perspective and experience. And we do our best to honor all of them. Now, earlier this year, actually in March, I was trying to call a meeting of all these people together from all over the country. And, and everyone said that they wanted to come to the meeting, that, that it was really important for them, actually. But as much as they said they wanted to be there, they didn't seem to be making it much of a priority. The dates didn't work. A location couldn't be secured. Nobody was happy with the travel arrangements. We missed a payment to the consultant. We couldn't agree to an agenda. 
Still, I soldiered on. But it was such a beleaguering strain to make this happen that, that I was secretly grateful when the whole thing was called off by COVID-19. When the pandemic struck, I was once again really frustrated and angry. I felt like that poor chariot driver stuck in the mud, awakened to a new revelation. God is working against us, I thought. But that really made me wonder, you know, what was my first clue? Amen. Let us pray together now. God, who guides us all day and all night, who comes to us as a pillar of smoke rising above the desert and as a fire burning bright in the night sky, come and make yourself known to us now. Bind us together with your spirit and give us a spirit of mercy as we forgive ourselves and as we forgive each other. And bless this new season of formation as we strive to form the world around us into one of justice and mercy and as we seek to be formed as a people who follow Jesus. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you? Such as this unseen, 
When we continue to answer the call to be the church here in our community, where we continue to love unconditionally, give generously, and share our love and light with the world. Friends, know I love you and I miss you. And until we're able to be together again, keep being bucket fillers and keep being the church. Let us pray now together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. Amen.